So in this video, I'm going to recap centroids uh, and also the second moment of area. So starting with centroids, um, it's another way of saying that you're looking at the center of area. So if you have some random shape, okay, what you're looking for is the center of where that area sits. So I guess it would be somewhere around here. And the symbol that we use to denote the center of area or the centroid is x bar and y bar um, for the two coordinates. So there's two different methods of calculating the centroid, and it's based on uh, whether you have simple or more complex shapes. So if you have simple shapes, um, the method is quite a bit simpler to calculate where the centroid sits. But if you have complex shapes, you need to go back to basics and apply an integral definition. So let's start with the first one, which is simple shapes, and I'm going to call this method one. This other one's going to be method two. So for method one, this is the equation that we need to apply. So the x-coordinate is obtained by summing together the x-coordinate and the area of all the different parts, which we're calling i, that make up our um, system. And a tote is the total area. The only other new one is uh, on this side we have yi, which is the y-coordinate of each of the different parts, again, that make up our system. So if you can imagine, we have something that's um, or a, uh, a cross-section that's formed by a few different shapes. So let's pretend it looks something like this, and we want to know where the center sits. So what we should do is divide this into more normal-looking shapes uh, that we're familiar with. So for example, we could divide this into a triangle here and a rectangle here. And each of those shapes, um, it's easy enough to find out where the centroids lie. Now, I've given us um, a few different ones to work with. These are the most simple shapes that we're ever going to see. So we've got a circle, which is pretty easy. The center sits, um, you know, at the center. <laughs> For a rectangle, um, if we have a length of D and B, we can see that the centroid sits halfway between. So B on 2, either way here, and D on 2, up and down. The other one I've given is a right angled triangle. So we've got a length of B and a height of H. And we can see that the centroid sits one third of the way across from each of the corners. So this is H on three and this is B on three. So they're the most uh, common shapes that we're going to need to use uh, for this method. So on this example I've just given, I've shown a rectangle and a triangle. So to apply our equations, what we need to know is the center of area for each of the little shapes that make up the big one. So for example, we can find the centroid here, which I'll call x1, y1. And we can find the centroid of this triangle, which I'll call x2 and y2. And that shouldn't be too hard if you know the dimensions, because you can just apply these rules down here. Then what you've got to do is work out the area of each of these sections. So I'm going to call this A1 and this one A2. And then it's just a matter of working out the total, which is going to be the two different areas added together, and then putting them into this equation. So if you have um, just two shapes making up your, your big one, um, all you need to do is I'll just do it for the x coordinate. It's going to be x1 A1 plus x2 A2 divided by the total area. So A1 plus A2. And of course, if you have other ones, um, you just continue adding them on the end. So that's the first method. It's really only applicable when you have simple shapes um, that uh, you already know the, the centroids of, just like the circle, the rectangle, and the triangle. So what happens, though, if you have something that's not quite so simple? So if we go down here, this is our, our second method that we're going to have a look at. So unfortunately what happens is you need to go back to the integral definition of working out where the centroid lies. So let's pretend that we have a, this is going to be an x and a y axis, and we have some function um, that we need to work out um, what the, let me make it a bit shorter. We need to work out the center of area, and let's say that we're interested in this shape down the bottom here. Okay. So in order to apply uh, this method, what we introduce is something called an integration element. So we're going to need to, to get, uh, use the integration element to replace in the equation this x tilde and also the dA and then the y tilde over here as well. So 
Introducing an integration element, basically you're taking a small slit of the area that you're interested in. So let me just rub this out for a second. And I'm going to take a really small slit in here. Okay, now remember that integration is basically finding the area under the curve. So what we're essentially saying is this is one piece of the total area. And if we were to slice this up into a whole heap of different pieces and add them together, we would have essentially the area under the curve. But what's special about the integral is it occurs as the size of this little slice in here goes to zero. So what we're going to do is call this, I'm going to call it dx. And the reason is I've taken the slice out of the x-axis. Okay. So this here becomes our integration element. Okay. And as I said, we're adding up all these little slices that you could potentially draw. But I've just got one general one that we're looking at. So we need to figure out where the centroid of our little integration element sits. And that is the x tilde and the y tilde in these equations. Okay, so this is the centroid of your integration element. So hopefully what you would be able to do, if this was a proper question, is you'd be able to write x tilde and y tilde in terms of um, x and y on the diagram. And there's going to be a couple of examples of this demonstrating it in the videos. So once you've got that, the other thing that needs to be replaced in the equation is the dA. And dA is equal to the area of the integration element. Okay, so again, you just need to work it out. It's like a little rectangle in here. So for this one, um, it's obviously going to depend a little bit on what your equation for y is. But basically, if we say this is a general point x, this is some general point y that corresponds to that, the area of this element is going to be dx, the width here, multiplied by the height, which is y. So this is only for this specific case, um, but others you're going to see... Um, you know, other, other things. So that's the general um, method for using the integration approach. Again, this is only recommended if you have a disgusting equation um, that describes the shape that you're interested in finding the area of. Okay, so I'll leave that at that and there'll be a couple of examples demonstrating how to do it. So I'm now going to move on to simplifying distributed loads, and this follows very closely with the centroid concept. So for this first one, I've given an example where we have a varying distributed load, and it gets to a maximum of 5 newtons per meter, and it's over a distance of 3 meters. So my intention here is to simplify this distributed load into one point load acting at an equivalent distance. So what I need to do is basically treat this shape um, like I'm trying to find the centroid of it. So it's a right angled triangle, which means we know the centroid is going to sit somewhere here. And we know it's going to be one third off the corner. So that's going to be one third of three meters, which is one meter. And this other side would make up the difference, which would be that two meters. Now, if we wanted to, we could work out the vertical component in here, but since it's a distributed load, you don't really need it because um, you're just going to have this as a point load acting straight through um, our centroid. So let's draw it. So this is our equivalent system. So we're making this one force, uh, one, sorry, this distributed load into one force acting through the centroid. Okay. So the only other thing we need to do is work out how big that one force needs to be. And we can do that quite easily because we know it's going to be essentially the area inside this shape. So it's going to be for a triangle, a half times the uh, base, which is three meters, multiplied by the perpendicular height, which goes up to this five newtons per meter. And if you watch the units, you've got meters times newtons per meter. The meters part cancel out, so all you're left with is an answer in newtons. So 3 times 5 is 8, divided by 2, that's going to be the same as a point load of 4 newtons. And if we want to, we should probably do it, we can draw in these distances to show the equivalent distance that that force needs to be applied at. So this is the equivalent of this. So let's do exactly the same thing, but for a rectangular uh, distributed load, also known as a uniformly distributed load. So for this case, again, we need to start with finding the centroid of the shape. And this one's really easy. It's going to be in the center of our rectangle. So it's going to be 
halfway along from either end. If this is 10 meters, it's going to be 5 and 5. So if we redraw our equivalent diagram, we're going to have a point load acting directly through the center in here, 5 meters on either side. And we need to work out the size of that point load, which we can get from the area of the rectangle. So area of a rectangle is going to be the 10 meters multiplied by the 6 newtons per meter. All that we're left with is the newtons, so it just becomes 60. So this again is the equivalent diagram of um, the distributed load. So that's all there is pretty much for simplifying these loads. It's just a case of figuring out where the centroid lies, drawing your point load through it, and then calculating how big the area is to apply the force. So moving on to our last topic, which is second moment of area. So this has another name as well. It's known as the moment of inertia. Again, exactly the same thing, um, just got two different names. So what is it? Well, it's a geometric property which measures how far away the area is distributed from a particular axis. So if area is quite far away, it gets or it, it attracts a higher second moment of area compared to if all of the area is very, very close to the axis. It's, it's not going to be as much. So why do we care? Well, the reason is it measures how well a shape will resist bending about that particular axis that you've, you've measured your second moment of area about. And this is going to come back in a couple of weeks where we start looking at the bending stress. So the symbol for second moment of area is an I, and the base units are meters to the fourth. Now, often though, we're going to be measure the, measuring these things in millimeters to the power of four, um, but you know, it's, it's all the same, just a matter of unit conversions. So we've got a couple of equations that we can apply, very similar to what we uh, do with the centroid stuff. So we've got two different versions I've written here. This one is for I about the x-axis, that's why it's got the subscript x. And again, you can see that we've got those little DAs appearing in the equation. And in order to eliminate them, you need to go through exactly the same um, method as you do for the centroid stuff in drawing your integration element and working out what the DA or the area of that integration element actually is. So this one over here is for I about a y-axis. And again, you can see it has DA that needs to be eliminated by drawing the integration element. So again, there's going to be examples of how to do that. Um, so I might just leave it at that uh, for now. So you only need to use those integration equations when you have shapes that aren't very standard. If you do have standard shapes, um, you can just look up what I is uh, in tables. So I've given two examples here for some standard shapes that we're going to commonly use. So one of them is a circle, and if we draw our x and our y axes through the centroid, we can measure i as being pi on 4 r to the fourth, and it's exactly the same for the y axis simply because it's completely symmetric. So for a rectangle, again, a centroid sits in the middle, and I've drawn my x and my y axis through it, and we can calculate our i about x and y axis, um, bd cubed on 12, or the flip side of that is db cubed on 12 for the other way. So that's pretty much it. all there is for this topic, and uh, I'll see you in the example videos.